I would start by introducing some of the panelists and I would give them a, a, a chance to say, so, um, give brief introductory remarks and then we, we move ahead. We have Modisola Iambo, we have Olusei Olusei Afolabi. Please forgive me if I don't pronounce the names correctly. I think I'm very known for butchery names. We have Monique with us, and we have uh, my good friend and sister, Katia Epalanga, also joining us. But before we start, I would, I would start with uh, Grace to give us uh, opening remarks and an introduction to our Women in Energy Network. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, quite excited. Uh, this moment has finally come, NJ. I'm really so excited that we can be together as women in the industry and um, as industry players as well, not just women. But firstly, the industry players to be here and to talk about our industry and more import most importantly, talk about our continent how the energy industry looks like when it comes to Africa. You know, you can talk about energy globally, but our focus is our continent, our beloved continent, Africa. The African Women Business Energy Network was launched um, on Women's Day. And it's a network that will um, be a pivotal connector between the energy women, that the women in energy and the opportunities that we have out there in the African um, energy industry space. We have so many women out there who really want to be part of the energy journey in Africa. There's, there's a transition, the energy transition that is ongoing and women are quite interested to be part of it as well alongside um, other colleagues in the industry. And this network is actually that platform that women can actually leverage on and be part of this um, energy transition, as well as um, the agenda we have of um, ending energy poverty in Africa by 2030, at least closing the gap. If we can't put a complete zero, let's close the gap by 2030. It's a continental agenda, and this network is actually there for women to come together and work together. The most important part is for women to come together, and we all work together in achieving this goal. So this, this is the first roundtable um, conversation we are having, the pioneer one, and we, look at, we are excited. It's going to be more of a discussion than us just complaining as women. Let's talk as industry play, more as industry players. Let's take off the gender cap and talk as industry players now. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. And, uh, and I would please ask the panelists to forgive my rude interruption when I do that. I am very good at interrupting people and following up with uh, more probing questions. Um, Katia, you serve as the executive director of uh, Sun and Ball. Picking on what Grace just um, opened, do you think we have enough diversity and inclusion initiatives right now, not just within Sonagor, but across Africa in the energy space at this very moment? And if, if yes, how can we improve? If no, how can we create it? Yes, Ayuk, good morning. Uh, my sisters here, my brother Ayuk. I'm so happy and thank you for this invitation. Thank you to put us together. As my sister Grace said, uh, we need to be together. We need to discuss. We need to have more and more into the table. Not only uh, complaint, but we need to discuss and uh, as we have uh, did last time in Angola with Grace, we start a very good conversations. Means that we need to continue. Thank you very much, Grace, to support us on that. And let's continue. I think from the questions that uh, we have, 
Uh, yes, for sure, we need to improve. Uh, we, we will stop improving when we have at least almost 50-50%. We are getting to, yes, we are working a lot to have this, but let's look at the initiatives. Let's just put on the table and discuss from the top to the bottom. I think we have a lot of good initiatives, education, uh, put people together like this forum today, as you have this initiative is very good for us in terms of the equality, inclusions, uh, but sometimes we need to work before. The decisions come is when the ladies uh, discuss where, what we're going to do uh, to put in the STEAM areas, uh, to work more in the related math, sciences, and so on. Another initiative is because of the energy transitions. Energy transitions comes with a very good role, good challenge, faster. We need to be faster in, into the decisions. The strategy should be changing very quickly into the organizations, means also opportunities for that. As you can see, the energy transitions came with a lot of new challenges. Let's take opportunities to take this challenge for us because we can get uh, the, the, I think the, the way that we have these challenges is the way that we get the opportunities also for equality and inclusion. Another thing that we talk a little bit about education, we can talk also about HR, uh, the way that the HR should be strategized into the organization. We need a, a top strategy from the HR to include and to be inclusive. Uh, we have also empowerment from the ladies. Uh, I think we have a good role on that. The way that they can see us is the way that we communicate more. I think many other initiatives can be done for a very good perspective in terms of DNI. Thank you, Ayuk. Thank you, Katia. But Katia, if I should press you a little bit more, we have seen a lot of the talk about this issue. What concrete actions can we do to immediately Start implementing this right now because I am personally I'm tired of us having these discussions over and over and sometimes you just have a lot of stubborn men who who probably sit in there and not really drive this how can we as an industry really take take action do we need a special set aside for what I say, a women set aside program or a local content that emphasizes a lot on this issue? Do you think that would really help with national oil companies and international oil companies and even other company, other institutions, whether it is renewables dealing with the transition and how we go forward? Thank you, Mr. Ayuk. To push me more. I'd like not to say that we need uh, some change, but practically, we can see that today the organizations have some policy. I think the regulations, the policy should be put in place also. Uh, besides what we have uh, discussed internally in terms of education, the programs, the, all the other initiatives, because we, we know exactly what we need. We need to have a very good, uh, in terms of levels and numbers, uh, today I'm in uh, organizations that we have about 30% of uh, these inclusions, diversity. 30% is uh, responding our needs. No, we need more. For that, I think uh, policies some regulations uh, aside all those programs, education, and also be sitting with the right people and discuss uh, all those issues. Thank you, Katya. Only well, thing I, I just want to kick off this conversation with you. You are possibly one of the few 
women I know serving in high leadership roles with an IOC that is really that's really driving um, just doing her work every day. Now, the big question is that how do we how do we encourage more entrepreneurship and participation in the upstream sector in in our industry? Thank you very much. And once again, uh, I join everyone in you know saying thank you to Grace for inviting me um, and being on this very very broad platform. Um, where we're talking about Africa, and we're not just talking about, you know, a singular country. So we're talking Africa here. Um, in my experience, and my experience is just one year short of 40 years. So I know that there is ample opportunities for entrepreneurial participation in the upstream sector, downstream sector, every sector of the energy um, industry, and not just only oil and gas. Now, participation requires a lot. Um, you can participate uh, from two main, um, I would say, categories. So you can decide to participate as an entrepreneur owning your own oil and gas company, uh, in Nigeria now, there are quite a few people that have ventured into uh, the ENP part of the business and their asset owners. So you can participate as an entrepreneur, as an asset owner, you have your own exploration and production company. You can also participate as a contractor. And in participating as a contractor, of course, there are broad categories of contractors as well but I like to put them in three categories. So you have what I would call, you know, small contractors, small size contractors that are looking for business that is less than a million dollars. Uh, you have medium sized contractors that are looking for business that is between 1 million and $10 million. And then you have the major contractors that are above $10 million. Uh, because once you start talking $10 million, um, then you need, you know, a bigger size insurance to be able to protect, you know, both the contractor and also the company. So um, two, two major areas, as an asset owner or as a contractor. Now, as a contractor, if you're in, you know, what I would call small contractor, less than $1 million, yes, you can start to cut your teeth and, you know, try to get into the business and, you know, the requirements are not as much. But if you're planning to get into that bigger space of above 1 million, $10 million and above, then proven track record is required. You have to have done it before. You, because no one is gonna take a chance. Um, the industry we are talking about, the energy industry, irrespective, renewables or even fossil fuels, a high dollar investment um, and in, I mean industry. And so once you know you are getting into that major league as a contractor or even an asset owner, then you have to have proven track record. And so but if I if I should stop you there, would you would you encourage women-owned businesses that are starting off? to maybe look at joint ventures with, with others as a means to get above that $1 million threshold? Or how do they go from not just being under $1 million, but to yes. get above that threshold where they can either break the barriers of experience and some of the things you, you raise? Yes, definitely. So joint venture operations, um, or maybe joint venture agreements, you know, with companies that are outside of Africa that have a pro proven tra track record, you know, definitely is encouraged. Now, that in itself also has its intricacies, which women must be prepared for. You know, there's no one who's going to go into a joint venture agreement with someone who cannot demonstrate 
certain things, you know, especially KYC, you know. So most international companies want to partner with someone that they know would not bring them any other problems in their own country. Because one of the biggest issues around Africa, of course, is corruption. So that's the big elephant in the room. And Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, especially for the Europeans and the Americans, is a big issue. So people want to know, who am I partnering with? So you must be able to apply that KYC test. So definitely joint ventures are encouraged. They can be done. They are more than you know, welcome to quickly hit that above that um, minor contractor or small contractor threshold. Thank you so much. Madam Fowl, Senegal is going to get what we call first oil and first gas this year. It is going to be a very historic moment for that country. They have drilled a lot of wells across Senegal and Mauritania, and that basin is actually seeing some progress. Big question. Is there a chance that Senegal will, um, will not repeat the mistakes of other African countries when it comes to producing oil and natural gas? And second part of my question, can you tell me that we are going to see an increase in women participation? That just means jobs, contracts, and also leadership. I mean, I take note that your country already has a woman leading its, its, energy industry, its, its energy industry as a minister, but that's not enough. Can we see more in the private sector in entrepreneurship? Please help us. Thank you so much. I would like to thank you first for uh, having accepted that uh, my minister, uh, Sophie Gladima, uh, proposed me to be here um, because th Wednesday is usually the Republican agenda for the ministry uh, meeting. So uh, that's why uh, she can't be here. Maybe she will be joining us uh, later. I think she picked the best person to be here. That's you. So if you make a mistake, now we know, we know, we know who, who to blame. So, <laughs> so the pressure on you. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Um, your question is a, is a big one. I would like just to begin uh, with something. Uh, the time for complaining, I think that this, this time is another age. It's not our age, it's another age. Africa don't have time again to complain, but Africa should take less lesson from everything that happened in one of our country and then don't repeat it again in another country. As this is a, a good chance to have oil and gas actually in Senegal. But we know uh, that there is a bad, a very bad experience across Africa. Uh, country that have it, this opportunity. So we learn about this, this lesson, this uh, mistake that have put some country neglecting completely even the uh, food security because they have uh, oil and gas. We will not uh, turn on this error we will develop, trying to develop any other uh, sector based on what we will have has, in, has uh, outcome from our gas and our uh, petrol. Uh, this is one thing that we will do. The other thing is, uh, let me just say, uh, tell you why I'm here. There is, uh, uh, a newly created uh, association that I'm leading, which is uh, the 
Recep Energy, called in French. This is a kind of network on oil and gas, but on energy, renewable energy too. So this network would like to be across all Africa, has an observer, observatoire uh, for taking care that women and, uh, and youth will be fully implicated from the beginning on all energy sectors. Because we know, as we know that uh, there was some mistake when a country has uh, discovered oil and gas, there is the same mistake that the UN is already always repeated that there is some uh, category that have been left when developing a sector. And this category are always women and youth. Energy is newly discovered is here. So the Recep would like at the beginning of everything to be on top of everything with this company. And I'm glad to be sitting here with the chief of company, uh, oil and gas company, energy company here uh, with this person to be sure by uh, through this observatory that they will take care of the fact that equality, gender and youth should be at all level, meaning not only being at the, at the bottom level, but being at the leadership level. To do that, we, we are also working with education, all institutions that are educating. And our strategy is to uh, let the young girls and youth in global to know that there is a lot of opportunity and then to make them choose actually in the, in the, in the, the bottom level of, uh, of uh, education, let them choose science and let them choose all kinds of possibility to be one of the leading person in energy. Thank you so much. And I, I still remember, remember you promising me Chebujen when I'm in Senegal. So the next time I'm there, please, I need my Chebujen. So I'll be holding you on to that. And I, I, I'm, I'm itching to go to Mojisola, but I want to go to Monique first. I think I want to connect this story from what we've had so far with the, with the panel with, with Monique. Monique, you you have gone, and I don't want you last because they're going to say you let this renewable girl to talk last. And so I think I, I think uh, Montessori can forgive me. But Monique, you've heard what your colleagues have discussed. How do we connect sustainable development with human rights, technology, artificial intelligence, and really still be able to close the gap and drive up things in the continent picking from the stories of what you've heard what you've heard in the past and you you were right there with green girls how do we bring in this new age how do we close this gap and really make this work good morning everybody thank you for for the invitation uh nj and the entire team if you hear noise in the background if i go off i'm in a uh, in a community not too far, I just arrived in Nigeria a couple of hours ago. So um, that's a beautiful question, NJ, and it is very broad, and it really gets into what we do, what we have been doing at the Green Girls Organization for the past eight years, using AI, because I am in the, the clean energy sector, uh, biogas and, and, solar, and solar energy. So the first thing we have to know is when you are in Africa and you in whatever sector you are, you have to choose your battles and develop solutions that are 
adaptable to the context, the hostile context. I don't care whatever sector you are in. I am in the energy sector. You have to make sure that- Monique, let me stop you. When you say hostile context, what do you mean by hostile context? Now, that would depend on how you want me to address the, 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 the question. No, go, go right straight ahead. I'm the only man here. If you have to hit me, it's your chance. So you just First go straight First of all, we have very few men in the energy sector, be it you know, oil and gas or renewable energy, my sector. The second thing is we have a problem of, um, we, have, we don't have policies in place. That's the second thing. The third thing is we have a lot of um, bottlenecks I call it unnecessary bureaucracy because if we have all these rules and regulations on paper, especially in a country like where I come from, Cameroon, and there's nothing uh, like tangible when you're on the field, then uh, it's, it's hostile because you're fighting everybody. Even the person you're not supposed to fight, you're fighting. And then you come in, you are a woman, and then for somebody like myself, my background is not energy at all or tech. I'm a trained girl practitioner. So let's not get into that NG. Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much for clarifying the hostile. And I think a lot of people here agree with you. So now yes. let's proceed. Yes. So like I was saying, the beauty of our work, especially at Green Girls for the past eight years is we are not only going into communities, that is African rock communities, and you know, providing them with energy, in this case, solar installations, and then you know, using organic waste that we find in these communities and providing them with um, clean cooking for that is biogas, but we are using the power of technology that is AI. It's very complex, but we've tried to simplify it. The first thing we have to know in Africa is we have a problem, we don't have, we don't have data. So data is a huge problem. And when we say data, what's data is simply information. And I don't know about everyone here on the panel, but if you don't have access to specific information, then it's very difficult for you to solve a problem you have identified, especially on the continent. So the first thing we have been doing for the past eight years is we are making sure that we are collecting data and with the help of this data, we are able to provide the specific clean energy solutions in African rural communities through an innovative algorithm that we, we developed that's harnessing the power of AI so that in the African rural communities, we are not just dictating solutions when it comes to providing energy solutions, but we are making sure that the communities that we are impacting on the African continent, the solutions we are providing, they are specific clean energy solutions because no two African communities are the same. And the West always makes this, this, um, this mistake. No two African communities are the same. Some communities have more access to um, sunshine all year round. Others, depending on the activities of the people, they will produce more organic waste. And to us, waste is wealth. So how about making use of modern technologies with the data you've been able to collect, you're providing the specific clean energy solutions. Now it is no secret that the primary victims of the energy problem, the crisis, especially my sector, the clean energy sector are, are women in the rural communities. It is the woman that is carrying the baby, going to look for firewood to come and cook, um, stopping from bronchial ailments, you name it. But in the 21st century, access to clean energy is a basic human right. Now, if I have to, and I strongly believe that there is a relationship between, we need both renewable energy and oil and gas because Africa has the resources. And if we have to harness the, 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 the resources that oil and gas can provide for us with proper governance in place, then our economic development, infrastructural development is going to be on an all time, is on an all time high. Now, the thing is, we have very few women on, on yes, on mute. You see, you just told me to unmute and interrupt you. So let me do, this is what I do best. I always interrupt and I always follow up and I always stop people. 
I know the minister, Minister Sophie Gladima from um, Her Excellence from Senegal is coming on, but I am picking on these stories and I just want to drive it. I want to drive it forward. Um, Mojisola really hits exactly what you're saying. Mojisola, we've heard from Katia, from Grace. It's about money. You are vice president of one of Africa's top deal making organization. And most people don't know you sitting in there, you have to look at finding the money and with everything that has been said by our, our colleagues, we need to be able to get financing and we need to be able to finance our inclusion and diversity in all forms of energy. How do we pick on what Olusei said with regards to moving from 1 million above 1 million if you are in entrepreneurship? What Katya talked about, STEM, women in science, how do we, and then also what Monique is talking about, data, artificial intelligence, you need money to finance that. How do women get in and really make that happen? For on a corporate finance and everything, because we don't know. Some of us, it's just very strange. And to see you, the lady with the money, doing all the big deals, but we don't know where to find money. <laughs> I wish I was the lady with the money, but money. But let me first of all start by saying good morning to my fellow uh, panelists and a very big thank you to the African Women uh, Business Energy Network for the opportunity to speak you know, at this maiden um, webinar. And um, I think first point to make is financing is gender neutral. So whatever you need to do to secure financing for any project or for any deal is gender neutral. And there are certain steps or certain considerations that you must always uh, keep in mind. Um, as Monique, no, it wasn't Monique. Um, let's see. Okay. As the last speaker you know, noted, you know, financing for one project is different from financing that is required for another project. So energy financing is very, very broad. So first steps, take a step back. It's important to determine what you know, type of energy project you're trying to finance and what is the scale of the energy project that you're trying to finance. So if you talk about scale, uh, think about it. If you're going to finance an off-grid uh, solar plant for my village in Nigeria, the financing approach that I would take would be very different from if I was trying to finance um, a large-scale power plant you know, um, to a, a big city uh, somewhere in Europe. Um, as you know, large-scale projects would typically require you to look for multiple sources of financing including guarantees from governments or multilateral agencies, just to make sure that the deal is bankable and that it works end to end. Um, I'll talk about two quick examples of deals that have happened in the last five years uh, locally here in Nigeria and how those deals have gone about um, to source financing. These are big time deals. So there was uh, there is a 459 megawatt Azura, Azura power plant it's on grid open circle that needed about a, a billion dollars in funding. To raise that funding, almost 20 different providers of capital had to come together, um, both on the equity side and on the debt side. So you had commercial banks in that deal, you had DFIs, you had guarantees even from the Nigerian government, from the World Bank, and even from MIGA. Even the state government who you know, uh, locally facilitated that deal is also a minority shareholder. I was able to provide equity funding uh, for that deal. Because of the scale of, 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 of the deal, it required you to speak to multiple capital providers. Another project is a Seplat Anno project, which is a gas processing uh, plant that would supply about 300 million scuff of gas to the domestic market in Nigeria when completed. That deal required about $650 million in uh, financing. Uh, about 420 million was provided by the equity partners and another $260 million provided from a local consortium of about seven local banks. So the point I'm trying to make is you have to think about 
what are you trying, what type of energy are you trying to finance? If, if it's a big time energy, um, energy project, then you probably would need uh, multiple fund providers and different types of capital. Um, then secondly is what type of energy? Are you trying to um, finance clean energy? Are you trying to finance your traditional oil and gas energy projects? If it's clean energy, there's certain sources that you should look at. So look at um, capital providers that are issuing sustainable debt, whether it's green bond, whether it's um, investors that are particular about ESG investing or even global climate funds. But your traditional oil and gas um, projects, you probably would need to look at commercial banks, um, um, agencies like Afex still um, fund your traditional oil and gas projects. Second, at the end of the day, um, anybody giving you money wants to be paid back at the end of the day. So you have to make sure that you, your projects are bankable and commercial. So you take your project and you look at it from end to end, have a good view of how the project will generate the cash flows. And anybody that is giving you money will need to be comfortable and have a line of sight to say, okay, this is how I will get repaid. You also need to look at the risk that is associated with your project, right? Whether it's construction risk, whether it's political risk, whether it's um, economic risk, and ensure that the risk is allocated to the party or parties that are best placed to mitigate so such risk. So think about um, financial feasibility, think about legal feasibility, think about economic feasibility, think about environmental feasibility, think, think about um, technical feasibility. So for most energy projects in Nigeria, there's usually a requirement to import technology or to import equipment from abroad. One of the key issues we have is around currency mismatch, right? You're exporting or you're, sorry, you're importing technology or you're importing products at USD. And those projects are going to be developed locally and you're going to get funding in local currency. And if you're in an environment where um, your currency is de depreciating, you need to ensure that you have the strategies in place to manage any potential uh, mismatch between the currency for funding the project and the currency in which the project would earn the revenues that are required to uh, generate the cash flows to pay everybody that has provided funding to you. The third thing to also think about, which is, I think is very important, is as an entrepreneur, whether you're a man or a woman, the type of financing that is required for any project also depends on the stage of development that that project is in, in the value chain. So I'll use Tesla as an example. Tesla was a company that wasn't known in the 1990s or in the early 2000s. Um, at that point in time, they were trying to prove a concept. So if they had gone to, uh, say, an IFC or they had gone to a commercial bank in the US to say, oh, I'm trying to develop an electric vehicle, please, could you provide funding? These are my numbers. This is that. The chances that they would have gotten the financing is very slim. So if you're at the very early stage of developing a concept or developing a project, whether it's an energy project or any other type of project, the type of um, source of finance that you would have available to you would typically be grants or donations or even your own money or seed capital or venture capital. But as you prove the technology, as you prove the market, then you can then move and engage traditional and even more established source of, of financing. Fourth point would be, there's a need for us to be creative and innovative about how we structure our projects and how we present our projects to ensure that we acquire the, we attract the required financing and also at the right price. So for example, um, I want to do say a, a wind uh, or a water, a water or a gas to power project, for example. I have a board and the board just has only male representation and I'm going to meet um, um, a financial provider that is very particular about diversity. The chances that I will get that funding, even if my project makes uh, commercial sense in terms of the numbers, I may not get the funding required. So we have to be creative and not innovative about how we structure and present those projects. And we consider the ESG imperatives around our project. Is, is there diversity shown in the board that, that would be providing strategic uh, direction for the project? Fifth is also the need to ensure that government regulations 
um, whether regionally or locally, also supports finance flow. One of the great things that happened in the Nigerian petroleum industry was the passage of the PIA in 2021. That provided the much needed clarity as to how the industry would um, function from both a commercial perspective and a technical perspective. And we can clearly see the effect that has had because post-2021, investors were more comfortable because they had a line of sight as to how the government was thinking, they had a light of sight into the fiscals for the industry. So we need to, in a way, um, also lobby and ensure that the right regulations are in place in the energy sector to ensure that it attracts the funding, the huge funding that is required over the next couple of years. Then lastly, which is an area that I'm very passionate about is, you know, there's a saying that says, you use what you have to get what you want. I think that we also have to look inwards locally in, 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 in our markets. How do we make our local capital markets work for us? In Nigeria, we have very significant pension assets. We have infrastructure funds that today have not been, I would say, properly tapped into. So there's opportunity to look at what's available locally to ensure that we tap into um, this, these huge potential sources of funding for the energy sector. I'll pause at this point. NJ. Thank, thank you so much, Dan. I think we just had a master class on financing in, uh, in, in, our, in our financing energy. And I'm very happy. Katya, I'm coming right to you because it's a question. Um, some really smart person asked a question. So I'm still trying to figure out that question. But um, Katya, I'll let you add on based on what uh, our sister just, uh, just explained. So I'll let you pick up on that. Thank you, Mr. Ayuk. I was just take advantage based on my position today. I saw Nangol is also facing some uh, challenge on the financing part. Uh, we know that in the past years, normally the challenge was related more with the compliance uh, part and the bank should not give any financials because of the, we need to be conformities in terms of compliance. Uh, with high corruptions in Africa and so on. Today is the energy transitions, which became today from financial part of uh, the ESG. I think we can take from the big holes that we would like to have the equality inclusions. We can take opportunities also to get these new opportunities that are coming from uh, uh, financing energy projects for the opportunities that we can get for the equality in the gender also in the inclusions. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very happy that with all the answers we see, we are not stuck with discussing microfinancing because every time we talk about financing around women, I always hear the word microfinancing. I don't really understand what is micro about women that you have to always we have to always we have to always, we have to always use that but to be able to drive up on this key access to finance when it comes into in, in in into the industry or let's say there is a young african woman in angola or senegal who is thinking today i want to I want to chill with the big girls and she, and she looks at you. What would you tell her? And also second part of the question, I think Madam Minister was trying to join us. What would you tell Madam Minister if she was here, but Madam Fall is here. So what would you tell Madam Fall on two part question on regulations that need to help include um, help inclusivity and diversity and entrepreneurship around our, around our industry. And second, what practical advice would you give to that young engineer who wants to really get up in the upstream as you have done so very well? I, have you, you, I mean, I don't even want to talk about your struggles to get up, but what, what would you tell her? So you're talking to two people. One, <clears throat> A young Monique who says yes. she's not, she's not, she, Monique, Monique is so smart, she tries to act like she's dumb, but if she, she, she says she's, I'm not an engineer and everything. And then on the other side, 
a minister about breaking those, about policies that break those barriers. Because as you see from all your, your fellow panelists, there's always the issue which comes around regulations and bottlenecks and all of that. So talk to a minister and talk to a young, a, um, a young woman who wants to, who wants to be you. Thank you very much. And you know, while they were talking, there was something that uh, you know uh, came to my mind. And especially when Monique was talking about policies, and then we've had you know regulations, and you know words like that. And I was trying to kind of like coin, coin something. So I said, policy lacking policing fails. So you can write all the nice words on the sheet of paper, it means nothing if it's not followed up and driven in the way that brings about results. So if I just kind of briefly go down memory lane, of course, for me, it was not, there was nothing in place that could say, this is how you treat a woman. Um, I always crack the joke about when I went for an interview with one of the major companies. And because my name is unisex in Nigeria, and um, it took a while for me to get a job. So after a while, I started leaving sex off my CV. So I'll just put my name and there's no sex. So I got interviews. So, and I showed up and they were like, oh, you're female. Yes, I am. You're female. Yes, I am. You're female. <laughs> I'm female. And there's nothing wrong with being female. I just want an opportunity here. And, you know, one company decided to take a chance with me and said, yes, we'll give you the opportunity. But that's hindsight. Now going forward, the industry needs to open itself up for any type of person who has the skills to actually get the work done. It does not matter male or female. And, you know, I always make it a point of duty to say to young people, <clears throat> excuse me, young females that never see yourself in this world as female. Well, let's say, let me, let me, let me, let me push you a little bit on this. You just said the industry has to open itself up. And I think, yes, sometimes we can blame government policies, procedures, and everything. What, why is this industry so low on participation, inclusivity, and diversity? I mean, I write about this all the time. Our numbers are less than 6%. That's a shame. It's an outrage. <laughs> Yes, it's an outrage. You can't still keep an industry where women are still the last hired and first fired. If if you were talking to the um, CEO of an IOC, what would you beyond just talk time for action? What do we really need to do to really say, let's move past the talk. Let's really make this happen. So we not have this same conversation in, in, in 12 months or 24 months or 48 months. Yes. So for me, two main issues. And one, the first one is a subconscious bias. Because people look at you and say, you're female, so we don't think you can perform at that level. It's a subconscious bias. The other one is also on the, for the female herself to not have an imposter syndrome. So when the door is open, don't think that, can I do it? I always challenge, you know, people of my gender, you can do it. That should be the first thing that comes to you. Not that would I be accepted. I am bold to say that my first accommodation in an offshore platform was the clinic. And they had no room for me except for the clinic. But I was willing to, be, to stay there. 
You see, I wasn't looking for special treatments. I wanted to demonstrate that I'm an engineer and you will not regret giving me this opportunity. So I'm not going to be asking for too much, but I'm going to work with you. And that's the thing about men. Because the men are already part of the network, they don't feel that same imposter syndrome that women tend to have. And so both of us on either side need to take away that subconscious bias that we tend to have towards ourselves. And then people looking at us sort of, we can, because women are very sensitive. You can see in their eyes, you can read their tone, you can read their body language. When you want to get into the industry that we're talking about, look at body language, just do the work. Just demonstrate that you're capable. You want to be an engineer, be an engineer. So yes, there can be policies in place, but a policy that doesn't get policed or even welcomed by the people would fail. So we must be ready to know that yes, 6% is not good enough. But it starts from very young ages that a small girl would say, I don't like mathematics. I don't like science. Or even parents would say, oh, why do you want to be an engineer and have to wear coveralls and look like a man? And, you know, if this is what this child wants to do, let the child do it. And if someone says, I don't like mathematics, why? Why don't you like mathematics? What's wrong with mathematics? But I'm not one to push, you know, I, I like for people to do exactly what's natural to them. But yes, there's need. We've been talking inclusion and diversity for a long time. And why is it not working? Because I believe there's an underlining subconscious bias on both sides, not just on the male to the female, but even the female to herself. I challenge people most of the time that look, if a man who was an engineer today was called to become the MD of a company, if his boss says, I'm gonna make you the MD, so I say, fine, thank you very much. I was already thinking that. But if they call the female and say, I'm gonna make you the MD, she says, oh my goodness, oh, I'm not gonna be able to do it, oh, you know? You're immediately thinking, oh, this is such a huge responsibility. How am I going to do it? You know, and then you're afraid even to tell your husband at home because, you know, you're going to worry. Oh, he's going to say, oh, we're both engineers. Now you're at the MD. Now you're going to be my boss. We are already thinking, you're already shortchanging yourself. And we've got to remove that. Females, we've got to remove that. And just know that, yes, it's an opportunity and I'm going to do it. And I'm going to get the support of my family. Depends on how you manage. Because in Africa, one major thing that we have to address is custom, traditions, and expectation of custom and tradition. It plays into the life of the female. Thank you. Very inspiring. I think we come in we're coming to an end. We have two questions. One, the one question I would ask it, I don't really understand it, but whoever wants to take it, shoot. There is a question out here that says, how is Africa thinking about the impact of CBAM, which starts in 2026 on its exports into key markets? CBAM is one of the elements of the EU Green Deal. The goal of to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 55% by 2030. CBAM is aimed at equalizing the price of carbon paid to carbon paid for EU products operating under the EU emission trading system, ETS, and imported goods. See, this, this, this is what happens when you get into um, diversity and inclusion. They bring all these really smart questions that I don't understand. That's why I cling to my oil and gas. But whoever wants to take this, please do. I don't even understand the question. I don't even know where it's coming from. But one really smart person decided to throw us off guard. So, and I don't want to let that go. You see, 
Katya, go ahead. Just to have a time for the other ladies then to comment better your uh, inter oh. interesting questions. <laughs> <laughs> Good. And I, and, I would, and I would close this on, on this I, final question in your closing remarks. Do you think, and I'll start with Katya, then we'll go to Madame Fall and go to everybody. Do you think we should have a women set aside, whether it comes with numbers in the energy industry across all? And what would you advise Grace and the Energy Chamber on this to put it on our major platform? And I say this. Is it time for us to say 40 to 50% of the energy industry must be women? And we push that through, whether it is comes with laws, regulations, and everything. And I say this with a background. I, rem um, I studied law in the United States, and one of the key things which I always looked at reading some of the civil rights history was a question which a journalist asked to Martin King Jr. He said, do you think having a law would make the white man love you? Dr. King responded by saying, a law might not make him to love me, but it might prevent him from lynching me. Do you think we need a specific law in Africa on women participation, diversity, and inclusion in, 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 in the industry? We've had local content laws, but the guys are always quick to have four or five companies as their local partners, and women can't even have one or a job. Do you think we need a women's specific program? That would be that would be police very well, I say you would say. I'll start with you, Katya, then I'll go with uh, since Madame Fall is the only government official here, she might even have an interesting answer for us. So Katya, go ahead. Thank you, Ayuka, for this important and, question. And, and at the end, you could do your closing remarks. And don't put us at, uh, into the troubles because I'm a part of the board, the board members. I'd like not to fight with my colleagues here because we are two board members, two women. And normally, Sonango have all the time one. I, I don't know why, but uh, for the 47 years of Sonango, just one board, executive board member. Today, with our Excellency Minister Diamantino, they put two. And the presidential decree also is getting more and more ladies into the, our uh, strategies. But I Katia, think, can we, Katia, don't you think it would be good to have 50 50 board memberships? If we cannot have participation in the industry, can we have boards? Because it's really important to have somebody making your case in the room when you are not there. Can we even go with board memberships, 50%? We, we are, uh, I think it's the way. We are on the way to that. We have started the energy business with no women. Today, we have two. We have had in the past just one. I think it's the way to get the 50-50% or just the, the very effective uh, people, the right people into the table. Yes, we can uh, uh, request more. The, the, the range should be from 50% that we are today in the middle terms for Africa to 50%. I agree with you. But uh, I think Madame almost say, put that is very exciting. Thank you so much because I remember when I started offshore working as an engineer, all the time men ask, but you are a lady. Yes, I'm a lady. Yeah, don't look like. When you are with us, you look like you are a man because it's some subconscious. They put some things in the uh, wrong side just to accept us. We cannot forget our conditions. This is true. We have a specific conditions because we need to work, but we need to be also a mother. And besides that, we have also other issues related to our conditions because the men never will get babies. And we cannot forget that. Even that we, we will do, I'm here, let's do it as an engineer, as a technical one, as a top leader. But we are a ladies. I have four babies. I'd like to have more three. But during the projects in the offshore, people say, what, Katya? How you do that? You look like a man, but you have babies. You have husband. People are subconscious 
with all those things in her, their minds. And thank you, Madame Olosef, because you bring the right word for our uh, fighting. And uh, I was very happy when uh, Mr. Ayub was here saying in our last conference in Angola, we are the last to be hired and the first to be fired because they are looking. They, women have a lot of problems to solve. We are managing the houses, we are managing our personal life, family life, and also the organization's life. What for last week in Berlin, they set up that in Africa to grow the economy, they need to put the women has a big hole because women have those strategies setting up all head in their lives. Means that will be help, uh, help Africa to move around because we are needing also this fast growing. I don't know if I replied to you because I was very excited with Madame was saying, saying, but Ayuk, yes, I agree with the 50%, but let's move into the way from 30% that we are today in Angola, we are moving for the 50% and we will support, support you to put this on the table so to discuss has a lot. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, Katya, there's a question for you, which I would, might come later as, at, the, at the closing, but let me get Madame Fall in on this same issue. Madame Fall, please proceed. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we are lucky in Senegal at institutional level because the minister is a lady. This is a, a kind of uh, chance that she's handling all institutional level to bring women, capable women, not only because she is woman, but if there is something that have to be shared between women and men, they they privilege the woman, the capable woman. So this is a chance. So at institutional level, she's creating new direction on solar, on uh, biogas, and so and so, and take care that all all issue in HR that woman is trying to get will be treated in the same way, in the same level, not discrimination at all. If there is discrimination, it should be a positive one for women. Uh, this is one thing. The other thing is we as a reject, we are at school level trying to get women really, uh, not women, but girls to get them really having confidence that the issue actually is an uh, energy issue. Uh, let me just uh, uh, tell you some uh, kind of anecdote. Uh, when I was studying a uh, long time ago, uh, agronomist, when I was studying agronomist, people told me, oh, you should study flowers because flowers are for, for women. My, my goal was to, 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 be, to become a mapper of uh, all land, African land, because I, I was sure that we have enough land to feed our people. This was why I chose agronomists. But I have been discouraged everywhere because mapping is dirty, because mat mapping you will take soil on, on, your, on, your, on your hand and it's not for women woman is for flowers. And this is things that not, is not actually happening, uh, I think, because what, what we uh, really have actually at school, and this is statistics that have been built in Senegal. Uh, girls are the best at the primary level. Girls stay the best at secondary level, but they are reduced because uh, there is uh, some lacking uh, at the way on secondary because they have get married, uh, force it to be married and, and so and so. And girls stay the best at the university, but there is a few girls at the university because at the university there are more men than, than, than women. Uh, law, bringing loyal on that law, law la loi, uh, on that will not actually help really what we think. 
because there is so much law that are not followed. So what we are doing actually in Senegal is encouraging by pricing. So RECEP is the relay between the administration, the institution and the people and the industry. And we are going through industries and uh, see how the rate is at the leadership level and at bottom level, how the rate is between women and, uh, and men. And we have prices for the AU and we have prices for uh, any country that is involved to encourage industry that are going upper and upper. They are progressing on the equality. But what we, what we said is not 50%. What we said has women have been reduced during all uh, scholarity. We said that 100% of capable women should be involved on, uh, on, the, uh, on the process and at all across level. This is not the 50-50. This is uh, because we have, have been uh, reduced uh, while we are progressing because we have been deviated in other kind of literature or being uh, housekeeping and so and so. So the, the remaining, the few remaining should be all involved at level that they, uh, that they own by their, their uh, intelligence, by their work, they should be all involved on it. Uh, encouragement is the way, encouragement, pricing, all, 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 all industry that is uh, really um, doing better and uh, law will maybe follow, will follow later because we know how it works. Thank you. Thank you. Monique, um, I'll give you a shot before I get to say it then. Uh... <laughs> Thank you, NJ. Um, personally, that's what we have been doing at the Green Girls Organization for the past eight years. Us is from a grassroots level and bringing the mentor on board because it's not all about talking only to the women, but letting the men to see that, you know, encouraging women to get into STEM, encouraging women into positions of leadership, it's not going to make you less of a man in any way, you know? So I am all for the fact that we should get more women in leadership positions in the boardrooms, but we should start from a grassroots level and also include the men. Thank you. Uh, say Olusei. Yes, first. I love what Madame Fowler just said. Man. Hundred percent of capable women. And if I could just, you know, help to shape a policy that could be monitored. Now, we must make sure that those women that graduate are employed. Because once they can get employment, most companies do have what they call the women interest networks. And once they come into the organization, then they can be monitored. Because what I have also seen, like she was saying, Madame Fao was saying, is that even as we progress in the organization, you see that the number of women starts dropping as they move up the ladder. You start seeing a lot more women dropping because of various issues. And I can quickly just touch on um, one example. So I used to sit on what we call the Employee Development Committee in my uh, old company. And one day, a manager brought to the meeting three ladies that were quitting. They wanted to leave, three women. And I said, why? And I said, well, you know, they just turned in their 
um, residential debt, as I said, well, before we even approve it, I want to speak to all those three women. And each one of them had issues around, oh, I got married, my husband is not in the same town as I am, and there's no um, Exxon Mobil company where he's staying, so I need to leave. Oh, my husband, you know, is in a particular country, I've got to move. You know, and it was all about that. So we had to design something around, okay, if we don't have a company where it's going, but you, we need you. So what about putting you on a rotational assignment so that you come in two weeks on and two weeks off? So two weeks when you're off, you're at home, you're at home, we don't need you in the office. And two weeks when you're on, you're fully on. Can you discuss that with your husband? Do you know we kept all those three women and they're doing well in the organization now? So what you need in every organization is number one, to make sure that as women graduate, they are employed. As they are employed, they are part of an interest network, women interest network that helps to retain because we women get to have issues along the line, the chain of development, but they must have people within the, the organization, mentors, bodies, you know, senior members who can mentor them and say, no, that's not a problem. I've been through that. I can tell you what to do. And so that would help. So that's, for me, would be something that we should consider in terms of being able to retain the women. Thank you. I believe Grace is taking notes. Um, Mojisola, over to you. Then we have one question for Katia, and then Grace is going to close. No, I couldn't, but you know, really agree with um, Madam Fowl's point and um, Shay's point spot on. But um, what I would just like to add to the discussion is it's also important as women for us to ensure that we're doing our own self development. You know, there's a saying, a popular saying that says you can take the camel to the river, but you can't force it to drink water. So it starts with you. So it's a push and pull. Yes, the policies are, are needed. Yes, the interest group and the mentoring is fantastic and also helps. But you as a woman, you're first of all an individual, you have to want it. And if you don't want it, no matter the policies or the, the push you're getting, you're not going to get to that, uh, to the point that you want to. So yes, women, there's a lot going on on the home front um, in terms of children and our spouses. But at the, at the same time, I think, you know, there's, it's a push and pull and there's a lot of self-development that needs to happen even within us to really be sure that it's something that we want, you know? And I love the, the word capital. I don't want you on my board just because you're a woman. I don't want to mentor you just because you're a woman. I want to mentor you because I see something in you and I know you're capable. So um, let's keep the discussion going um, and um, great insights from all the panelists. Thank you. Katya, I did not want to bring you on, but we have one question which is lagging. And it says question for Katya. And after this, make, please make your answer very short. Then Grace is going to give us a closing and a way forward. But it says question for Katya. Namibia has announced its third oil discovery. These new discoveries could make Namibia the southern neighbor of OPEC member Angola, another oil producer along the African Atlantic coast. What synergies can be found potentially between Namibia and Angola when it comes to oil production? Are you nothing related to women, no? <laughs> it has nothing to do with women. It's just all about the synergies between Angola and Namibia when it comes to producing oil or can there be a collaboration given the, the, that they are neighbors? Thank you, Ayoka. And just to conclude the previous thought will be quickly, encouraging the women in the business and also working to maintain those women as Madame Olo says, saying that we need to work to maintain because most of the women start the business in the energy but because of those challenges they move around 
the late uh, Namibia. Uh, we are also looking the opportunities that we're gonna have from the blocks uh, beside with Namibia, which for us is Namib. We are working to see all those opportunities around because the, there are coming new developments. Means that today we can also see those opportunities related to the logistics parts to create conditions to accommodate all those new facilities. And also you will see that not only from Namibia that the new blocks come in new development, also from Namib. And if we put together all the oil combination, uh, the totally we will need more efforts from our companies that will be developing those projects in Namibia and Angola in Namib. Thank you so much. For, um, I, I read somewhere ExxonMobil is going to be looking at doing a $200 million drilling campaign in the Namibia Basin. So that's going to be really, really interesting what is happening around that piece at this time. Grace, you are the boss of all of this. I think we want to thank you for bringing all of us together. We want to thank you for driving it. We want to thank you for basically bullying me to make this happen. And very few people can really knock me off than you. But uh, we really appreciate it. And we would, we, really honor you driving the chamber towards this and guiding us and it's, it's not been easy you have basically tasked yourself to make this a key cornerstone of of your work can you please close this really amazing event i came in here i've learned so much and i really want you to close this for us so that this can be this can happen Thank you, NJ. Thank you for all the panelists. Very insightful discussions. And Kathy, you talked about Katia, you talked about the opportunities, Angola and Namibia. That this, this is just one of such opportunities we have in Africa. And uh, you mentioned uh, women. There's no opportunity. What did you say that there's no opportunity for a woman, or there's no? And I didn't really get it. But I would say, as women, we'll come together and create that opportunity and make sure we see opportunity there. So, um, Albert, just to clarify that us women, if there's no opportunity there, clearly stated that this is for, for women, we will come together as women, collaborate and create an opportunity there. You we'll find the opportunity there. You know. So the Alben, that's the African Women Business Energy Network, is actually a platform to, to actually go for such opportunities with other putting the women together and make sure we go after such opportunities. It is, it is a platform where women can work together and deliver. And it is a platform where women can also work together and through the energy transition journey. So it's really a good opportunity for us women to work together alongside with the men, you know? Yeah, in terms of, uh, Muji talked about funding, financing. She let, gave us a good lecture on funding. So we can, when it comes to funding and she says there's no gender identification, there's no gender. So we women need to work together and uh, we're going to have the funds. We know it is possible for us to carry on upstream, midstream and the over 10, 10 million dollar project, we should be able to do that as women in the industry. So Alben, going forward, we will continue to work uh, women own entrepreneur own businesses in the in the industry, the full value chain, not just upstream, not just the um, oil and gas, energy full value chain. Monique, being in the renewable side, you can you are also a member of the Alben. We were going to send out another link how you can come in into Alben and have women register so we can identify women in the industry and link them up to the opportunities we have. We need to continue work together. Thank you so much. This has been a wonderful session. And I'm so grateful for, you see me, but I have a strong team behind me. There are powerful women behind me. We've all put this together and this has been a su successful. Within Two weeks, this was done. So I would want to say thank you to all the powerful women who have stood behind me and have supported fully. Thank you, team. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. And uh, I, Madame Fall, we really want to thank you. 
and please extend our sincere thanks to Minister Gladima. She has been struggling for an hour to get on. I think that is that basically speaks to how important this issue is that you have a woman minister having to walk away from cabinet today's cabinet day walk away from cabinet and some reason probably some men is probably blocking the internet they are probably stole money for corruption there is no internet to, to try how to try to get on but please thank her for all of us we really appreciate her continuous struggle with internet i think when women make so much money they will give by special internet but uh, you know mojisola thank you so much katia um thank you say thank you monique thank you you can be our african director i think your voices need to be very very stronger i don't need no nobody coming up from a wealthy country talking to us about energy poverty and what we should do with the climate you should be speaking for us and i think we will all will encourage you because you understand our trials our pain but you also understand our need to have cleaner better sustainable energy development on behalf of the african energy chamber i want to thank everybody for listening to this world class conversation which was not just about gender it was about africa it was about our industry it was about really moving our continent forward and please do a reach in touch with everyone on this panel they have dedicated so much time to be here and talk to you do not make a mistake by just shutting off and going away search them read about them follow their story and please ask questions to them it might not they might not give you all the answers that you want but there might be that one answer that might be able to guide you through a difficult path because they have lived a life worth living they have seen so much and from their stories we all could learn and improve ourselves and not just women but also men who are here they could see ethical principled leadership that our sisters and uh, have exhibited right here thank you so much and for for giving us a chance to be part of this and i really hope that we can have a chance to do this again i wish every month we have to keep the conversation going to ensure that it doesn't fall on the back let's make it let's put women on the main stage not on the side corner of all discussions and projects in energy god bless you thank you <laughs>